what are some of the signs that we get before we die? So there can be multiple signs. So I'll give you an example of my aunt's mother-in-law. She was like passing away and suddenly she saw that there were four men in dark clothes waiting to take her away. And she started shouting. You can have these very physical signs. The person may actually see dark robed people waiting for her to be taken away. Some shaking kind of sensations. Their limbs will start moving in a certain way. And you may know that the consciousness is leaving the physical body. Sometimes you have stories where people will say like this man was absolutely fine hail and hearty mm. and he passed away mm. but before he passed away he was saying things like abhi to bahut kam samay bacha hai somehow the soul is aware that it's going to leave the physical body what are some of the moments right before death example of my father he demonstrated to me what an out of body experience is i asked him papa what what are you doing and he said i'm moving out of the body and returning back to the body Oh. So at will, you can even create an out of body experience. A soul who is aware it's going to die and wants to wait for all the rituals to take place. So it may not immediately leave. It may stay there, watch the death rituals taking place. It wants to see that oh, his son is okay or his wife is not crying too much, and that is why you feel their presence around. They will not immediately depart. Dr. Tripti Jain, a highly celebrated clinical psychologist, past life regression therapist, has been a trailblazer for her groundbreaking work on past life, gaining nationwide acclaim for her show *Raj Pichle Janam Ka* on national television. Dr. Jain has also featured on the third episode of our podcast *Body to Being*, which saw over 1.3 million views. Let's say I've died in a car accident, or naturally, or suicide. Does the kind of death? affect my next birth let's say clients who have committed suicide in the past life i said okay so do you want to go and see what's happening at home so they will travel their consciousness will travel to their home and they will see their parents grieving and they'll get very upset if you opt to die yeah. and in a way that is not natural then you are going to carry that depressive symptom forward you will carry those sadness all those emotions will be carried forward and you will create a hell after life for yourself have you ever heard of somebody a poor man living under the bridge of bombay committing suicide no isn't it surprising yes they will not commit suicide they will not kill themselves the next topic i want to talk to you about ghosts do they exist will do part puja ye wo some rituals hmm. to remove the spirit but the spirit doesn't go away yeah. one day two days one year two years i've had people who've called me and said ma'am 20 saal se ye spirit mujhe tang kar raha hai have disembodied beings come to you ghosts come to you <laughs> so i had this doctor from pune who came to see me now during a past life session suddenly they say Five to seven bodies are shown to you at the time of birth, and you will be choosing the body related to the lesson that you have to learn. Can one body inhabit two souls? So you know you have this uh, saying hmm. that "Aapi ke jaise saath log aur hai." Eighty-four lakh yoniyon ke baad aapko manushya jivan milta hai. Eighty-four lakh yoniyon mein kitni saari desires humne create ki hogi. Hmm. And also when you're born in the human body, you have multiple desires. Hmm. You may be a doctor, but you wanted to be a singer. Hmm. You're a singer, but you wanted to be a businessman hmm. to fulfill the multiple desire it has created in multiple lifetimes. So sometimes. the soul can split into seven bodies and these seven bodies can live in different parts of the world a clairaudient and psychic a dedication to unraveling the mysteries of the human soul has led her to conducting workshops on past life therapy spiritual numerology and transactional analysis cementing her legacy as a luminary in the field of holistic wellness in today's spiritual wellness episode of the body to being podcast we are delighted to welcome for the second time the illustrious dr tripti jain what is pitrudosha and do we suffer from some kind of an ancestral trap Namaskaram Namaskaram Dr. Jyoti Jain it is wonderful to have you back the last episode was loved by all and we're so glad to be doing this again with you even me i think the last episode uh, was watched by everybody all over the world and they loved it so the last time around we spoke about the secrets of past life 
let's take it forward from there. So what are some of the signs that we get before we die? So sometimes you can have these very physical signs. The person may actually see dark robed people waiting for her to be taken away. That is one way in which the person will have a, a signal that the person is going away. Second, you can just have a feeling that you're being pulled out of the physical body. Like the consciousness is now feeling that it's being pulled out of the physical body. So they'll start having some shivering, some shaking kind of sensations. Their limbs will start moving in a certain way. And you may know that the consciousness is leaving the physical body. Sometimes, you know, you can have signs prior to death. That means like maybe death is going to be in the next two or three hours. And the person may say things about his childhood or they may start seeing their parents who've passed away, their grandparents who've passed away many years ago. And they'll say that, oh, they have come. And then he will talk about his childhood memories. All this will start happening. Or they will tell you that, you know, where is the kind of money kept or how much is there in the bank? So they'll say all these things to you. You know, when my dad passed away, before he passed away, in the night, my mother was with him. And he told my mother, you don't have to worry, and I've secured your future. And he told her about all the bank accounts and how much money is there and where's the papers kept and everything he told her. So it is like the soul knows that mm. it's going to leave. So it will kind of prepare the ones who are going to be left behind. There can be many ways in which you would have an idea that the soul is leaving the body. Not at the time of death, but even prior to the time of death. I've heard of stories where people will discard their things. So if they have some 20, 30 saris, you know, they will start giving it away. And then they'll be told, why are you doing this? And they'll say, no, no, I want to give it away. Or they'll give away vessels, saris, stuff like that they can start doing. And you wonder why they're doing this. Because, you know, she's fit and fine, but the soul is already preparing to leave the physical body. It's not necessary it can happen just because it's an accident or something. It can happen in natural death. Like, you know, sometimes you have stories where people will say, like this man was absolutely fine, hale and hearty, mm. and he passed away. Mm. But before he passed away, he was saying things like, Abhi to bahut kam samay bacha hai. You know, I may not be able to see my son who's abroad. Mm. Bete, tum aajao mujhe milne ke liye. And the son will say, that, Papa, why are you saying all these things? You're hale and hearty. Mm -hmm. But somehow the soul is aware that mm. it's going to leave the physical body. Mm. So people should be a little aware. You mm. know, when people start talking like this, then maybe the time has come for them to leave. Hmm. So whether it is natural death or accidents or any other unnatural death, they will always way. give signs. Yes, they will always give signs. What are some of the moments right before death? So right before death, you will have some physical symptoms, hmm. right? That the physical body will give you, like flailing of hands and uh, your eyes going up and down, like, you know, like maybe your eyes will start opening and closing. They'll be staring your mm. eyes will start staring. There'll be some shivering, shaking of the physical body. Um, the person may have some breathing changes, like the breathing will start changing. All these kind of small symptoms are there before the consciousness leaves the physical body. Even the temperature of the body will start dropping. It will start getting colder mm. because slowly the consciousness is moving out of the body, right? Mm. So all the symptoms that people have when they move out of the body, like when they have an out-of-body experience, so, you know, I have observed people having an out-of-body experience, which is not, uh, which they actually can do it to themselves. So, again, the example of my father, he uh, demonstrated to me what an out-of-body experience is. This was just two days before he passed away. And um, I had gone to meet him in the afternoon and he just told me, uh, just sit next to me. And he lay down on his bed and he said, put your palm over my forehead. And I said, Papa, why are you doing all this? Because he used to do a lot of these yogic experiments, you know, with himself. And I didn't want him to do all this. So I put my palm over his forehead and he said, you just have to observe the temperature of my body. And after a few seconds, I observed that the temperature of his body had become cold. And then after a few more seconds, the temperature of the body became warm. And then again cold and again warm. And I'm talking about deathly cold, okay, not just cold. And then I asked him, Papa, what, what are you doing? And he said, I'm moving out of the body and returning back to the body. 
So at will, you can even create an out-of-body experience and return back to the out-of-body experience. Why would be doing that? So I think it, it, was like a, it was like a preparation to leave the physical body. Many yogis tend to do this. They will prepare. See, you can't, I mean, they are yogis, right? Mm. So for them, it's like a game, how you can play around with the physical body. So my dad was doing that. He was playing around with the physical body, preparing me possibly that this is going to happen to me. But, you know, I was so young and I was just wondering why is he doing these kind of things, you know? And I was really scared because I knew somehow that, Something is going to happen, mm. obviously, you know. So this, these kind of things some people do. I mean, my dad used to do that, you know. Just experiment with himself, with his physical body. Mm. So some people can do this. You can have or you can create an out-of-body experience at will, mm. which I have seen my dad doing. Mm. In uh, yoga, mm. it is said that the moment of death becomes very important and in fact the whole science of yoga is to prepare you for the moment of death because if you leave consciously and in awareness then you have a heavenly experience but if you try to cling on Correct. and even panic which most people do Correct. they're panicking uh, because they're losing out on mm. themselves mm. then you have a hellish experience so I, I always say that you can sleep while you're alive but you can't sleep when you're dying when you're dying, you have to be more aware than when you're alive. Because at the moment of death is when you're going to create a new script for yourself, right? So whatever script that you had, your life script in your current lifetime yes. is actually going to vanish. Yes. But it won't vanish if you are not aware. You'll carry it with you, hmm. right? So you're dying in pain. You'll carry that pain because you're unaware. Correct. But if you're aware, you will leave behind that pain, become aware that you're not the body and move away as consciousness, as a soul. Mm. So that is why the moment of death is extremely important. Mm. I always say that people should create a death will. Okay. You know, how do you want to die? Mm. Right? You want to die in the hospital, you want to die at home, you want to die in a specific place like maybe your kind of childhood home. How do you want to be dressed when you die? You know, you want to be dressed in white, you want to be dressed in bridal wear, you want your hair to be made up, you want some makeup to be put. You know, you should actually create a death will because the, it's important to understand dying and death both. But nobody discusses dying and death. They, they, they will avoid discussing it. But it should be discussed because like you said, it's an extremely important moment of life. You may have not lived life well, but I think if you die well, your next life will be much better. Mm. So we should also be looking at art of dying and not just the art of living. Absolutely. Mm. You know, the problem is that people are so bound by this golden cage that they don't want to fly like a bird. Mm. But if you are aware, you can actually break the golden cage and experience freedom. Mm. Recently, I met somebody in Bangalore who had a near-death experience. I think it was last year in November when he had gone for some heart, heart surgery and post that he had this experience. He shared and he said, my life changed after that experience. I became so easy with life. I didn't take stressors. I mean, he's already 80, 87 or something like that. But he said, I feel more free because I've experienced what it is to be without a physical body. Hmm. So people who have near-death experiences have a taste of what it's going to be without hmm. the physical body hmm. and then their life becomes much more easier. Hmm. And even uh, shloka people who do past life regression therapy and they're aware, you know, they're more aware or their soul is more mature, let's say, they understand that death is only a passage. It's not that scary. Hmm. And I think that's how they lose the fear of death. Mm. And I genuinely feel that if you lose the fear of death, your life can be better. Mm. But ma'am, what about the suffering that's associated with death? Because our scriptures talk about, you know, something called as Bhairavi Yatana, which is mm. intense suffering in a moment mm. where lifetimes of memory play out. So mm. there is this, the association with death is one of fear because of the pain, I'm assuming. So, you know, let us understand that somebody is having cancer. Mm. Okay. And he's suffering. Mm. Physical body is suffering. Okay. Mm. You know, it's very interesting, which I've experienced mm. in many sessions is when you die mm. and you are, your body is suffering with mm. illness, mm. somehow at the moment of death, mm. the soul leaves the physical body. So it does not have to 
carry forward the physical suffering. So the body is suffering. Mm. Okay. But the consciousness, the soul will leave the body. So it does not carry the suffering. Okay. It's like in a simple way, if I can explain, a vehicle whose fuel is close to empty. So this body, the fuel is close to empty. The mm. consciousness is close mm. to empty. Mm. Okay. So most of the consciousness has left the body. Mm. All right. A little bit of it is there just mm. for the organs to function well. Okay. So now the consciousness leaves the body. The body is suffering. Mm. It's, and it continues to suffer. Mm. Okay. But part of that little consciousness is there. Most of it is out, out of the body. Mm. So it does not carry the pain. Now this can happen if the soul is mature and aware. If the soul is unaware and attached to the physical body, then it will carry the suffering. Does it make sense? Yes. How does the moment of death define my next birth? So there can be three ways in which this can happen. One, somebody who's unaware will carry the pain from the physical body to the next lifetime. Okay. Because the soul is not that mature, soul is attached, uh, soul is possibly left behind a lot of money, family, wishes, desires, right? So it's still attached to the physical body. So now such a soul dying will carry all that pain and suffering and desire and attachment and everything. That's one. Second is a soul, you know, who is aware it's going to die and wants to wait for all the rituals to take place. So it may not immediately leave. It may stay there, watch the death rituals taking place and then leave the physical space. Because it is still attached, but not that attached, but still, you know, it's kind of in conflict. It wants to see that um, maybe, you know, his son is okay or his wife is not crying too much or whatever, whatever reason it is. So some souls wait for the rituals to take place. That is why you have Theravi. Mm. So some of them would wait for 13 days and that is why you feel their presence around. They will not immediately depart. Okay, that's the second way in which things would happen post-death. And the third are those souls who have come and gone so many times on this planet that they are happy that they are going to leave the physical body. So they don't even wait for the rituals to take place. They will just leave immediately. So it depends on the maturity of the soul okay. and how many incarnations the soul has had. Because if the soul has had many very little incarnations in the physical body, in the human body, it is trying to understand, you know, what death is all about. Mm. But somebody who's had many incarnations physically, you know, like thousands of incarnations, they have already completed their task. So they don't need to stay for the death rituals. They came, they did their task and they left. Mm. So it's, it's very variable, Shloka. It can't be the same for everyone. Mm. Let's say I've died in a car accident or naturally or suicide. Hmm. Does the kind of death affect my next birth? So, you know, my consciousness is in the physical body hmm. and I die in an accident. Hmm. I'm about to get married, hmm. but there's a car crash hmm. and I die. Hmm. Now I have this desire hmm. because I want hmm. to get married hmm. to my loved one. Hmm. Okay. Now, at that moment of death, I'm going to be mourning my own death. My consciousness will mourn my own death. Oh God, what's happened? And I may not even believe that I have died because it's so sudden. So my consciousness will stay around, you know, in that area where the body is lying and now the ambulance has come. So I'm watching. I'm mm. watching mm. all this taking mm. place. Mm. Mm. But I still don't believe that I'm dead. Okay. Because the body is still there and my desire to get married is also still there. So the unfulfilled desires will be projected mm. by my consciousness as if it is taking place. Because they say that earth is a school mm. where we are learning things. Mm -hmm. But afterlife is also like a school mm. where we are able to fulfill our unfulfilled desires. Hmm. So the mind will start projecting whatever desires I have left behind so that it will take possibly a few seconds for the mind to do that. And once I do that, I'm okay, okay. to move away. Do you have any such experience in your, uh, among your clients? So among my clients, I'd say that they would tell me like when they're in the past life session, after the past life they've seen yeah. and they've died. Yeah. Let's say clients who have committed 
tried in the past life. Yeah. Now I will tell them, okay. So they'll say, Abhi, what am I going to do? I, I said, okay, so do you want to go and see what's happening at home? So they will travel. Their consciousness will travel to their home and they will see their parents grieving and they'll get very upset and all that stuff. They will see that happening, okay? Now they now when they move from there, they will recreate their childhood, which was happy. So in afterlife, they will create a scene where they were loved by their parents, where they felt fulfilled by their parents, where they realized how much their parents loved them. Mm. So this is recreated by the mind. Okay. And then after that, they feel comforted and then they're able to move ahead. Mm. This happens to many people. Mm. Yeah. So afterlife is very interesting, Shloka. Yeah. Correct. Because death is interesting. Like we said, you die aware. Yeah. But afterlife is very interesting mm. because it's in the afterlife mm. that you will experience things that you wanted to experience, that desires that you had for the future. Mm. Okay. You know, you had, maybe when you died, you had this uh, idea that uh, a few years later, I will have a child. Mm. Mm -hmm. And now it's gone, right? Mm. Because you've died. Mm. So in the afterlife, this person will create a scene, okay. will project a scene that he, she is having a so baby. all of this is happening after? After life, yes. Ah. After life is okay. like life. Okay. It's not that you're dead, yeah? you're alive, right? In another dimension. In another dimension, you can create all this. My consciousness can create the whole drama for me. I can create a hell. And how is hell created? Mm. That's interesting yeah. also, right? So let us say, after I die or mm. even before I die, mm. I'm guilty of many things. Okay. I've done some small sins, some big sins, mm. okay? Mm. But I haven't been punished for it. Mm. Nor have I punished myself, nor has somebody known about the sins that I've committed. But I am aware of those sins. So after life, I will punish myself. Remember, my consciousness is the purest aspect of me, right? It knows the wrong that I did and the good that I did. So aware, very much aware. And now it wants to punish itself. Even if I'm a psychopath and I don't feel the guilt, my consciousness will. Yes, my consciousness will. See, a psychopath or an antisocial person is doing it for many reasons, right? Maybe he's come from poverty. Maybe he was... Abused. Uh, yeah, he was abused, abandoned. So many reasons are there for the human being to do all that, right? But my consciousness is aware that I'm doing something wrong. But my physical mind is overpowering that consciousness because for many needs that I have, for many desires that I have, so I will continue doing those wrong acts. Mm. But at the moment of death, mm. when you're about to face maybe God or the, you know, the universal conscious, whatever you want to call it, I will be aware of all the sins that I have committed and I will create a hell for myself. Uh, so hell and heaven is not a place, but it's our own creation. It's my own creation. Is your hell and my hell going to be the same? It can't, right? Because my sins are not your sins. So how can we both have the same hell? It's not possible. So I will create a hell which is actually commensurate with my sin. It is going to correspond to all the sins that I have done. Mm -hmm. So suppose if I've burnt somebody. Mm -hmm. Now in the hell that I'm going to create, my physical body is not there. But can I still feel the sensation of burning? Yes, I can. I can create a sensation of burning exactly how my physical body would feel, I will feel. Mm. Don't think without a physical body, you cannot feel things. You can. Mm. In your dreams. Mm. You feel so many yes. things in your dreams, right? People run and they sweat and they feel that somebody's after them. They feel pain. They yes. feel so many things in their dreams, right? Because obviously the kind of indriya are there. You have the kind of karma indriya. You have the jnana indriya are there in the sukshma sharir. So it can create this for you. But after death, also it can be created. So your hell or your heaven is your own creation. Mm. But when I believe that hell and hell are my own creation, I will take personal responsibility for what I do in my current life. Yes. I think that's the reason I feel and believe that hell and heaven is something that I create. 
So now we talked about heaven and hell being your own construction. Where do we go after that? So as you know, uh, in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra and in other scriptures, they, they mention about the 14 lokas, right? So you have uh, Patal Lok and then Mahar Lok and Bhuvar Lok and many Lokas are there. So the consciousness, the soul will travel to one of the Lokas. So it is like a dimension that you will go to. So suppose if your maturity of your soul is that it wants to, it has the capacity to go to let's say Bhuvar Lok, then you will meet the semi-divine beings there. You go to Mahar Lok, then you'll meet the souls which have been become let's say enlightened. You go to Patal Lok, you'll meet uh, the king of the serpents, you know, mm -hmm. Vasuki. Uh, you can go to places which are, let's say, kind of demonic. Or you can go to places which, which have kind of asuras. It depends on your state of consciousness, your state of maturity, where you will be going. Because you will obviously go to that loka which is going to resonate with you. Mm. You can't go to a loka which is not resonating with mm. you. And that is why, again, death is important. And even prior to death, what have, what have you been engaged in? What have, been, what have you been doing in your life? What is the occupation and work that you have been doing? And whatever work you have been doing, ha have you been corrupt? Have you been righteous? What have you been doing? That is how your mind is going to be created. And that's exactly where you're going to land. So that is why life and death, there's nothing like death. Hmm. Death itself is a myth. Yes. Right? Death itself yes. is an illusion. Yes. There's nothing like death Correct. because there is no death. Yes. For the soul, it's just life, 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 life. and life. You know, you are living in a, another dimension, you go to another dimension. So people who think that, oh, you know, uh, I've, I'm going to die and so now it's all going to be over. It's not going to be over. It's going to start. So don't think that whatever you have done in your life is going to be left behind. It's going to be carried. You know, ma'am, with this, um, this really goes out to individuals, especially who take their own life mm. and think this is the end of it. Or mm. even euthanasia. I was mm. watching this documentary. Euthanasia has become such a big thing in Europe because people mm. feel like this is going to be the end of suffering and it's not, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah. It's, you know, like you rightly said, the art of living is okay, but the art of dying is more important. Why people don't believe in the soul is a question that really needs to be asked. But I think some research or survey that took place some time back in the USA, they said that one out of every four people believe that they have lived before. Mm. And the fact that as a past life regression therapist, I have people coming from all backgrounds, all let's say religions, there is a belief that there is a soul mm. that is not going to die. Mm. So I think the more people talk about death and dying, death ke mein baat mat karo. it's very, mm. it's very kind of depressive. Yeah. And, uh, it's not supposed to be depressive. You can prepare yourself for something that's going to take you forward. Absolutely. You know, and some kind of transformation you can do in your life before you hit that point. Mm. So, I mean, euthanasia, you know, people, like you rightly said, that people are opting for it. Exactly. Self-euthanasia, mm. people with uh, depressive symptoms, they have chronic or refractory depression. Mm. They think they can't get cured. And mm. so they want to end their lives. It's not euthanasia of Correct. people who are actually suffering, let's say paralysis or some such thing. Correct. But this is individuals who, who want are to self, opting. who are opting for it, which is, yeah. you know, amazes me. So I can only say that if you opt to die. Yeah and in a way that is not natural, then you are going to carry that depressive symptom forward. You'll carry those sadness or whatever else that you're carrying at this moment, all those emotions will be carried forward and you'll create a hell afterlife mm. for yourself. So it's better to fix all of that. Absolutely, when absolutely. You must fix yourself. If you are upset about something, fix it. You're depressed about something, fix it. If you feel that you have a certain desire, wherever, to go wherever you want to go, please go. You have a desire to eat a certain food, you get married, you have children. Well, if you can't get kids, it's okay. Go to an orphanage and be of use there. Mm. Fulfill those desires. Please don't die with desires. Mm. The moment you understand this, you will die empty. Yes. 
But people are not dying empty. You know? yes. They're dying with so many desires that they are going to create something or the other afterlife. Mm. So the afterlife phase is very, very crucial mm. because that will determine the next life. Mm. So between lives, Shloka, what happens is that you will do a life review first. Okay, there'll be a life review. Whatever life you have lived will be reviewed. In that life review, like a movie, mm. will be played. In your mind, you're only going to play the movie. Nobody is going to play the movie for you, right? So you play the movie in your mind and now you're going to know, oh my God, I missed this opportunity. I think I should have not been angry at my boss. If I had been okay with my boss, I think it would have climbed the ladder faster. But because of that, my life went to, I had a lot of struggle to do. Mm. And then maybe you betrayed your girlfriend or boyfriend and that will be shown to you. And then other things will be shown to you. Maybe you hurt somebody, you were rude to somebody, you were mean to somebody, you hit somebody, you caused pain to people, you maybe left your aging parents and you didn't take care of them. So many things are going to be shown to you. Mm. And you're now going to, from that review, understand that, oh my God, you know, I should have done this. Mm. I should have done this. Now, a part of it you will have to come back and do physically. Okay. Everything cannot be uh, dealt with in afterlife. That's important to understand. Let's say not looking after your aging parents. That you will have to do in the physical plane. But let us say not being kind to somebody. That can be created in your afterlife where you learn how to be kind. See, earth is a school and afterlife is also a school. So in afterlife at the school, you're going to be taught how to be kind. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to be born and look after your aging parents, but if you haven't learned kindness, how will you look after your aging parents? Mm -hmm. So kindness will be taught to you in afterlife. So you'll go to a school, mm -hmm. there will be a teacher, your mm -hmm. guide, your spirit guide or whoever is going to come and put you in situations where kindness will be taught to you. Not that you go to school and some book is going to be given mm -hmm. to you, right? You will be put in situations where you will learn to be kind. Got it? Mm -hmm. So let us say learn to be kind, learn to be happy, learn to enjoy what you have, learn to live in less. That is also beautiful learning, right? So in this current lifetime, you didn't want to live in less, you know. Uh, you wanted to have more. And you felt that having more, I'll be more comfortable and I'll buy a new swanky car or something like that. And because of which you took a loan. Mm. And after you took that loan, you know, you couldn't repay the loan. And then the bank took the car away mm. and then you suffered. Mm. Okay. Now you haven't learned to live in less. Mm. Now in afterlife, you'll be put in situations where you will learn to live in less. So that when you return back you may be born in a family which is middle class. You'll have to look after your aging parents. You'll have to be kind and learn to live in less. So some things you will be taught in afterlife so that when you come back again, mm. you will use those uh, values and fulfill your learning when you come back to earth. Mm. So this is how you move, right? In your current lifetime, what you're doing, look at what you're doing. Then you'll have a review. Then you will be put in situations where you will understand certain values that you have not been able to learn. Now you're being taught there mm. by a kind, compassionate guide. Mm. So you will learn it, mm. correct? Mm. Now, after you learn those, now a lifetime will be planned for you. Uh -huh. So that what you didn't learn, you will learn better mm. because you've already learned what you needed to. Mm. So this is how we progress life after life. Mm. Mm. Once you understand this, that see, the values that you have to learn are all divine values, mm. right? Compassion, kindness, love, uh, helpfulness, mm. right? All these are mm. wonderful kind, uh, divine values, loyalty. Mm. So start learning. Mm. So the next time you see a poor man on the street, know that he's burning all mm. his karma and he's learning the most difficult lessons that you and me cannot. So bow down to that person. We need to become humble when we see poor people, not become sad when you see them. People say, yes. oh, bichara garib mm. aadmi, uske paas mm. ye mm. Nahi, mm. Wo mm. Nahi hai. they feel guilty. No, 
look at the humility of that mm. man who's putting his hands out to yes. you yes. and saying please give me some food can you and i do that no we have our ego ke hum aise thodi kar sakte hain hum thodi aise hain but that man is doing it mm. imagine how much his ego is broken yeah right so next time you meet a poor person bend down mm. even in spirituality people do this from time to time they go on sadhana where they just making yeah. a lot yeah. of monks do that yes. but even in in uh, the yogi culture people yes. do that yes. and that's i'm assuming to just break their ego absolutely yeah. it's very difficult very very difficult to do mm. that hum kisi se koi cheez mang nahi sakte socho mm. hai na so this is how you develop humility mm. because this is going to help you in your after life mm. so that the next lifetime you take mm. will be better mm. because you'll have all these wonderful values with you mm. that's what i always tell people yes it's beautiful the next topic i want to talk to you about i think is everyone's favorite about ghosts or what we call as disembodied beings do they exist and if they do why is it that only some people can experience them so this is a very controversial topic first of all so i'm going to talk from my own belief system and uh, my own experiences that i've had right because i don't want to ruffle anybody's feathers so for me if i look at the upanishad and i look at the advait vedanta philosophy it ca- it speaks about oneness okay so let me explain this now a little uh, more so we have a physical body sthula sharir now this sthula sharir is suffering or not suffering but obviously as we are born on the earth we are going to suffer mm. now we think of ourselves as whole and complete right but are we whole and complete we are not we have many parts in us right we are made up of many parts one of our part is our infancy mm. where possibly we were born and maybe abandoned childhood where maybe we were molested or abused or maybe we went to school and the teacher hit me okay every time there has been stress or trauma to this physical body a part of me has got affected yes right now that part is collecting some emotion it could be pain hurt anger guilt maybe violence anything okay now these negative so called negative emotions or emotions which are unhelpful are being collected in my physical body yes okay now there comes a time in my life when there is a very difficult phase that comes in my life and there is a trigger okay now that part of me so far i have been wearing a mask right? i'm happy smiling all mm. that stuff but that part of me is you know can kind of ruminating mm. itself okay mm. it's eating itself mm. it's become possibly can fragmented mm. now this fragmented part of me can take any form it can take any shape it can take any color and it can project these emotions it can first start projecting these emotions in my dream state okay because sukshma mm. right physically in my physical world i don't want to talk about it mm. but when i go to sleep mm. i have no control over it mm. so it will start coming up mm. okay and maybe in my dream i will see a shadow i will see some demonic form i will see some evil you know ghostly form right and i wake up with fright mm. oh my god what's happened why did i dream like this okay one day second day third day and these dreams keep coming to me mm. and i start believing that maybe i have some spirit that is affecting me mm. some ghost mm. that is now started affecting mm. me okay and slowly i may start believing that there is a spirit attached to me mm. i'm okay mm. but that spirit is not making me okay mm. so i can blame now whatever i'm doing mm. on the spirit mm. correct remember life is about taking personal responsibility mm. not about giving away personal responsibility mm. right so now this person who believes there is a spirit attached to her or him behaves in a certain manner will do part puja ye wo some rituals mm. to remove the spirit the spirit doesn't go away yeah. right one day two days one year two years i've had people who've called me and said ma'am 20 saal se ये स्पिरिट मुझे तंग कर रहा है बीस साल से देर इज नो अदर वी हैव टू 
अंडरस्टैंड देर इज ओनली वन देर इज नो अदर राइट वननेस का मतलब क्या है मैं ही हूं राइट mm-hmm. ईश्वर right? मेरे भीतर है तो दिस डिवाइन ईश्वर विल इट अलाउ सम अदर स्पिरिट टू कम टू मी नो ही विल नॉट डू दैट राइट सो ऑल दीज स्पिरिट दैट पीपल कॉल आर एक्चुअली योर ओन डिस एम्बॉडीड सेल्व दैट इज वाई आई से स्पिरिट री अलाइनमेंट थेरेपी नॉट स्पिरिट रिलीज थेरेपी ओके यू कैन नॉट रिलीज समथिंग because it belongs to you hmm. there is nobody else who so is affecting nothing, me there's nothing known as being possessed no possession okay. in the term of psychology and psychiatry is a mental disorder we, oh. in our hospital we've had people who come and they're diagnosed with possession syndrome it's a condition it's a psychological hmm. condition which is treatable you can treat it the person can go away whole and complete because all these disembodied selves are mine only mm. i can fragment which is true you can fragment i'll give you an example of a young girl who had come to see me whenever she would go to buj at her village mm. uh, in a particular festival where uh, she used to have this mata that would come to her and she would behave in a very right. odd manner yeah. eerie manner yeah. and then after the festival was over she would come back home uh, to bombay and she would be okay when i asked her mother that here in bombay does she have all these symptoms she said ha huh, jab ghar mein if there is a clash hmm. you know some trauma is taking place at home some fight some argument or somebody say something rude to her she'll get this mata but then we feel mata hai hai na to usko hum namaskar karte hain theek hai now when i did a session with her and i spoke to her before the session i just checked with her about you know what she is upset about in life and what does she want in life she wanted to get married but she was a little like her weight was a little more okay thodi overweight thi and she was very upset about her physical body being overweight and people would be constantly even reminding her ki tum apna wazan kam nahi karogi na to shaadi nahi hogi so now this part of her which was constantly worried about being overweight started reacting in this manner because now people would bow down to her they would say good things to her they would be scared of her fearful of her and slowly she started getting what she wanted they'll say like that that means they're very much aware of it so we have to understand scientifically isko approach karo that are we one no we are made up of many selves we call them basically kind of secondary selves we call them right so we have within us a self that wants to make money the money self within us i have a self which wants love the loving self mm-hmm. within me i have a self which feels abandoned the abandoned self i have so many selves living inside me any one or two of them can become disembodied and begin to project itself okay the key is to wholeness we have to work towards wholeness we have to work towards becoming inclusive mm-hmm. not exclusive yes. now how do we become inclusive when we keep all these selves together mm-hmm. so if a part of me has become disembodied i have to work with this disembodied self mm-hmm. and bring it towards me not away from me mm-hmm. because i have to become whole mm-hmm. no mm-hmm. but problem here in spirit release therapies they will say you go yeah you go to light yeah but the light is here it's not outside me right prakash kaha hai roshni mere bhitar hai ke bahar hai mere bhitar hai i am light i am a soul and i am light so bring it towards me hmm. not away from me so we have to realign ourselves rather than releasing hmm. anything from ourselves this is my take on hmm. spirit release and this disembodied selves hmm. in uh, earlier times when people used to do exorcisms that is incorrect as per you nothing goes away from you hmm. nothing can why would something go away have i come with all some somebody no then i've come with myself hmm. and my many past life memories hmm. my many past life selves also i've come with hmm. that is why in past life therapy you can release you can understand that oh i was this in that particular lifetime hmm. right hmm. Yes. and then when the person moves away hmm. from that lifetime hmm. we will say 
bury the emotions there. The emotions that are causing you mm. fear, bury it there. Okay. And now come, whole and complete. Mm. But this phenomenon of believing that there is something separate from you, yeah. That I am not able to comprehend, yeah, honestly. Sure, sure. Okay, because for me it is I have to become whole. Mm. I have to integrate all my selves so that I feel healthy. Mm -hmm. If I remove my hand, am I going to feel healthy? Mm -hmm. No. Mm. How can I remove a part of me and feel healthy? Mm. Because that part does not belong to anybody else. It belongs to me mm -hmm. only. So the way I work with people who tell me yeah. such things, okay, is very different than the way somebody else would work. Mm. Because I don't believe sure. that I have to release anything from anybody. Mm. I believe that I have to integrate this person and make this person feel whole and complete, take personal responsibility for whatever is happening to her so that you can cope with the traumatic events in your life better. Mm. Rather than blaming somebody else, mm. Let's start taking responsibility mm -hmm. for what is happening in your life. Mm -hmm. And I feel that's the way work has to be done. Mm -hmm. You know, I was reading some time back the, the verses from the Chandogya Upanishad. Mm -hmm. And one of the verse stuck to me, okay? I think uh, if I'm remembering right, it was some 6.4 or something verse. And in which it was said that there is no other. Mm -hmm. You are the one creating your reality. Mm. So if I am creating my reality, not some of it, not most of it, but all of it, then this is also my own reality. Yes. How can it be somebody else's reality mm. coming to me? Mm. It, it was a beautiful verse. I, of course, I don't know Sanskrit, so I can't uh, say the words, but it was really nice. And there was something else that I read after that. There was some kind of uh, explanation about the verse which said that if you're passing by a potter's house and the potter has a lump of clay in his hand, the potter has made different pots of different shapes mm. from the same lump of clay. Yes. So this is exactly how we are. We are this lump of clay mm. and we have different shapes within us. Mm. Any of that shape can break mm. or any of that shape can decide to create some hell for you. Mm. But it's all happening in me. I think this is how I would like mm. to understand spirit realignment therapy rather mm. than release therapy, mm. SRT as they call it. Okay. Because this understanding of mine, I think has helped my clients tremendously. Okay. Because they've understood that their life is their responsibility mm. and they cannot go here, there, everywhere mm. to search for solutions yes. uh, which actually are creating fear yes. for them. So this is how I would approach. Mm. What about mediums, ma'am? People mm. say I'm a medium. You know, uh, this particular atma comes to me. This being comes to me, talks to me. Is that real? So, you know, mediumship is real. Mediumship okay. can happen. Okay. okay. Because the medium, I mean, not all mediums, but there are some good mediums, yeah. right? So what happens during mediumship is you go into a meditative state. Okay. And... In that meditative state, because you access the sukshma, sukshma, most sukshma part of you. Subtlest. Subtlest part of you. Yeah, you access the most subtlest part of you, which somehow connects to the subtlest part of somebody who's passed away. Okay, okay. And the telepathic transmission can start taking place. Because this whole, the whole universe, not the physical world, but the whole universe is like a uh, internet. Mm. It's like a matrix, correct? So some te telepathic transmission can take place. I'm thinking of you when you call me. Mm. That's also a, some kind of transmission. But you are talking to me on the phone. Mm. But this medium is having a telepathic transmission with somebody who's in a, not in a physical form, mm. in a subtle form. But for that, she needs to be a great meditator. She goes beyond the physical body. Like when you sit and meditate. What happens when you sit and meditate? One of the most beautiful things that happens is you feel you are larger than the body. Mm. Have you noticed mm. that? You have a feeling of expansion. Yes. Right? What is expanding? Physical body cannot expand. Yes. But that, what is expanding your consciousness, you're feeling that consciousness. Consciousness is expanded. But in the physical form with your eyes open, you are not able to feel it. Mm. But when you close your eyes, 
you start feeling that expanded self mm. of yours which is your consciousness mm. first the sukshma part the subtle subtle and the subtlest mm. so these mediums can get to the subtlest okay and then they can possibly get some transmission okay. from the ones who've passed away okay but not from somebody who's passed away 10 years ago somebody who's passed away maybe in the last couple of months you know who is still in the life between life stage okay somebody who is in the life between life stage is still in the subtle stage mm. so some transmission can take place from there mm. that's how mediums work okay have disembodied beings come to you ghosts come to you <laughs> so like i said before ghosts is not something i'm going to entertain i have uh, come across people who are showing me their disembodied self is how i'd like to put it okay so i had this doctor from pune who came to see me and he's a good example to understand this also so he came to see me and uh, he was overweight and he had some digestive issues and stuff like that and he wanted to work with it now during a past life session suddenly he starts talking in a, a gruffy voice his body starts moving up and down like he's actually able to move from the bed the supine position like this and come down and come up and come down he's talking in a guttural voice to me shouting like scolding me okay that why are you doing this to me kind of stuff so i realize that there is a part of him that is fragmented and this fragmented part needs to be dealt with so i started speaking to the fragmented part because the doctor was not speaking to me in his voice the fragmented part was speaking to me in that guttural voice so i started speaking to the fragmented part and this fragmented part was talking to me okay and the fragmented part indicated to me that he was like a tantric and he was doing some pujas okay and he was speaking some shlokas and doing some pujas and stuff like that and then i told him that uh, what are you going to achieve by mm. doing all this and you are disturbing this person because i'm speaking to the fragmented part mm. so i have to speak to him as if this aspect this person is different than you yes otherwise how is it going to integrate with yes. that person right so the fragmented part told me uh, you uh, i'm not going to go away i'm going to trouble this person because this person is doing things to me which have disturbed me and the whole story that unfolded was this doctor used to go to ujjain the mahakal temple regularly mm. and sit in the crematorium okay and he would be looking at these tantrics doing these pujas and he also would you know say the shlokas and do the pujas and all that and he had the some particular tantric which he used to visit regularly who would talk to him about what his life was like he used to eat raw flesh and whatever else that he used to do okay now this doctor started getting influenced with this tantric and a part of him started behaving like that and he started eating meat which he was not eating before he started eating meat and that is how his digestive issue started mm. okay and slowly slowly his behavior also changed not that that some atma had gotten to him he himself mm. was creating a aspect of him mm. which was acting like a disembodied self okay so during the session i integrated when i spoke to this mm. disembodied self and had a conversation mm. with it and slowly 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 integrated it with the self mm. which was the healthy self mm. right now during this process this doctor that self was actually not very much aware of what was happening to mm -hmm. him but after the session when i had actually taken a video of mm. of it because you don't see such mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. frequently mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so i taken a video of it and i showed it to him he was stunned and he said that's the reason i have the stomach issue and then he told me more about himself that you know he was doing some kind of alcohol he used to take and um, he would be doing some pujas and saying some mantras which his wife was very upset about and after that he stopped going to gym after the session he became absolutely fine absolutely all right there was no problem with him all his issues were solved 
because the integration was important mm. and that is the reason i even showed him the video because he wanted him to be aware that it is happening to him you are doing it then he told me you know he spoke to me about mm. many things about why he was attracted to ujjain and stuff like that not that somebody told him to go to ujjain mm. that aspect of him yeah. wanted to go to ujjain mm. so he was going to ujjain mm. but after that he stopped going also mm. and he's absolutely healthy there's no problem with him now mm. so what i'm trying to say is that when you work with such people mm. who are showing their disembodied selves yeah. it's important to understand the philosophy and integrate them together okay. rather than releasing things mm. from the person mm. if i release things from the person how is the person going to get whole and complete it sure. is his own self yeah so i know a lot of people mm. who are watching it may you know say that there is somebody else's mm. spirit mm-hmm. getting attached so i'll give an another another example let us say you're staying in a building mm. and you have a daughter who is uh, having problems in mm. school mm. okay who is feeling depressed or having study stress and doesn't have too many friends mm. and his teacher has scolded her whatever mm. okay and somebody in the society commits right mm. now this child is aware of that person but doesn't know that person mm. okay but there is discussion mm. in the house oh you know that child was in the 12th yeah. standard and this child committed so is बेटे तू फिकर मत कर तेरे साथ कुछ नहीं होगा तू तो पास हो जाएगी समथिंग सम कॉन्वर्सेशन इज टेकिंग प्लेस दिस गर्ल इज गोइंग डाउन टू प्ले एंड पीपल आर टॉकिंग अबाउट दिस गर्ल हु इज कमिटेड सो नॉट दिस गर्ल इज एट द वीकेस्ट मोमेंट ऑफ हर लाइफ शी इज बिगिनिंग टू आइडेंटिफाई विथ दैट गर्ल हु कमिटेड Hmm. मेरे साथ भी तो ऐसा ही होता है hmm. मुझे भी तो टीचर चिल्लाती है मैं भी तो स्कूल में अच्छे मार्क्स नहीं लाती हूँ hmm. uh, मुझे भी तो मेरे पापा मम्मी बोलते कि तू क्या करेगी आई एम बीइंग कंपेयर्ड सिमिलर थिंग्स दिस चाइल्ड इज नाउ फीलिंग इज इट नॉट पॉसिबल दैट अ पार्ट ऑफ दिस चाइल्ड विल फ्रैगमेंट यस and now this fragmented part yeah. will start behaving hmm. in a certain manner and this child will start showing me symptoms yes. where i feel maybe some spirit has got into her yes but such a child when brought to a psychologist can get better without doing any spirit release therapy okay so you start working in a healthy manner mm. with the child mm. make the child feel that she has the power mm. to get well mm. give her some positive words some affirmations mm. do work with her to get her confidence up mm-hmm. speak to the teacher go to the school mm. i'm sure the child will be fine there will be no 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 problem with the child hmm. i want to talk about rebirth now so we've talked about death we've talked about in between we've talked about disembodiment and now rebirth how does the soul enter a new body or a new womb so after death we spoke about after death yeah. right you took a review uh, you have now understood hell and heaven yeah. and now you are planning for a new life okay now it is not necessary for you to be born immediately mm. it depends mm. it depends on the after life state mm. okay now when i start the process of being born again i have to choose my parents first okay my parents will be chosen reviewing what do i want to learn from my parents or what do i have to do for my parents do i want to have parents my entire life alive do i want to have my parents dying early do i want to have my parents one of my parents dying when i'm 20 i'll have to plan yes right because that's very important mm. that also will be planned according to my lessons that i have to learn suppose i have to learn to look after my aging parents going back to the example i gave then obviously i will choose my parents to have a long life because i had to look after my aging okay. parents suppose i have to learn about taking family responsibility which i did not take in my previous some some of my previous lives then i will choose my father dying early so that i take family responsibility and i become the bread earner for the family if i want to learn about what it feels to be abandoned and have a rags to riches story mm. then i will choose that my parents leave me on the street and i'm adopted and then i have a rags to riches story 
there are so many permutation combination. First of the choice of parents, then choice of my body. What kind of a body do I want? Okay. A male or a female body? Mm. Do I want a body which is crippled? I want a body which is healthy. I want a body which is plump, overweight, uh, slim, thin, weak. I have so many choices. Yes. They say that about five to seven bodies are shown to you at the time of birth. Your guides will show you five to seven bodies and you will be choosing the body related to the lesson that you have to learn. Even the looks? Even the looks. Even the looks, the kind of looks that you want. You want dark skin, you want fair skin, you want skin which is possibly kind of pigmented. So many choices are there. There is a lot of choice. And you have a lot of free will to choose this. It is possible that you don't want a crippled body. Though you have a lesson, a postponed lesson, where you have to learn how it is to feel completely dependent on somebody. But you don't want to do it now. That's why the body was shown to you, crippled body. But you say, no, I'll do this later. But now I want to learn this lesson. Can I please learn this lesson and pass in this, which could be maybe to have fame? I want to experience fame. So can you please give me a body which is going to be famous? But the crippled body, I'll, po I'll learn it later. Why you later? can do that. Why later? Why not never? Uh, because those lessons that are to be learned will have to be learned. There's nothing like never. Like I spoke about poverty. That cannot be learned in the afterlife. That you will have to learn in the physical plane. Certain lessons have to be learned with people in the physical plane. And certain lessons can be learned in the afterlife plane. So certain things you have to learn here. Having a crippled body, why you have to learn it in the physical plane? Because you have to learn about dependency. You have to learn about understanding the human body how it operates, but you can't operate it. That helplessness that you feel, because possibly in some lifetime, you have done it to others. You have crippled others. You have killed others. You have uh, maimed others. So now you're born with some hand missing. Isn't karma very subjective? I could be a soldier in the military, yeah. having killed an enemy. Correct. And then how does the payback happen? So if you're a soldier, are you killing them out of vengeance? No. Or are you killing them out of duty? Duty. Okay. So duty is different and vengeance is different. Okay. If I kill somebody out of violence, ah. out of vengeance, out of anger, right. out of trying to get something from ah. them, then karma will, you know, can, what should I say? Karma will follow you. Hmm. But if it's duty, it's a job. It's yes. an occupation. Yeah. You know, you've chosen an occupation. Yeah. That occupation demands something. Okay. So that is duty. Hmm. Right? You're not doing it out of your own free will to kill. Yes. You're doing it because you've been told to do it. Hmm. Because there is a, uh, this is the work that you're doing. Hmm. So that is different. But if you're doing it for personal gain, hmm. personal ambition, hmm. then it's different. That is karma. Okay. That will follow you. How many days does it take for the soul to enter a new body or the womb? It's variable. Okay. The soul can enter at conception. Okay. Because it wants to be with the parents for nine months. So at conception, the soul will enter. And many of these souls, later on in their life, you will find that they may get married, but they'll get divorced and go back and stay with their parents and look yes. after their parents. Because they've entered that conception, the, the connection or the contact or the contract is, I'll be with you, mama, papa, always. Hmm. Sometimes the soul, generally the soul enters at three to four months. Okay. When they feel a little more comfortable uh, with the fetus, that growing fetus, and they may enter at that time. And sometimes they may enter even at the moment of birth. Okay. That can also happen sometimes. There's also a soul swap phenomena, you know. Where, where there is a soul 
that is going that is in the fetus mm. it is going to be born mm. okay the a child is going to be born and suddenly the mother's sister passes away mm. and the mother's is very close to the sister mm. and wants the sister to come back to her then there'll be a soul swap okay. the soul that is in the body of the unborn child will swap places with the sister's soul and the sister's soul will come in to the body that's just going to be born the baby that's just going to be born that okay. can also happen i've seen that happening in a couple of cases okay the soul swap phenomena that can also happen but we always choose the womb right we always choose yes. our parents because yes. it's a typical saying right we never mm. choose our family but we always choose our friends so that's absolutely incorrect no absolutely not yeah why would i come into this world not knowing where i'm going to be yeah. born yeah. does it make sense to me yeah okay can one body inhabit two souls so you know you have this uh, saying mm. that aap hi ke jaise saath log aur hai correct as i like saying hai ji hai na Now, in the world uh, in the world yeah so kya possible hai aapke jaise saath log aur hai possible hai why as uh, it is said in you know in jainism that 84 lakh yoniyon ke baad aapko manushya jeevan milta hai aise Jee. kaha jata hai theek hai ab 84 lakh yoniyon mein kitni sari desires humne create ki hogi hmm. right and also when you are born in the human body you have multiple desires hmm. uh you may be a doctor but you wanted to be a singer mm. you are you are a singer but you wanted to be a businessman mm. so many desires you have uh, you are a singer but you want to now have a family life be married have four children have a wonderful home have a swanky car but so many desires mm. right now in a single lifetime a soul is not able to fulfill the multiple desire it has created in multiple lifetimes so sometimes the soul can split into seven bodies and these seven bodies can live in different parts of the world doing different jobs some one married one divorced one single one unmarried different permutation combinations mm. one male one female one having a different sexual orientation mm. all this can happen mm. because the soul can do anything mm. it can create anything it can wear different costumes mm. right so it is possible that one soul can split into at least seven bodies okay but not all souls the soul that is quite mature hmm. quite understanding of this phenomena can do it so um i want to talk about still births you know mm-hmm. the the fetus is fully developed everything is fine but there's no life in the fetus that happened to my my bua to her first uh, child was a stillborn girl hmm. why does that happen what's happening with the soul here so still births are more to do with karma of parents okay it's not the still born baby okay it's more the karma of parents some of parents have to learn a lesson some karmic lesson of um, grief and so this is created it's a contract it's not that of course parents are unaware of the contract but there is a soul contract between the father mother and the still born baby that this okay. will happen because you have to learn about grief okay you have to learn about loss you have to learn about what should i say you know most of these ch- parents learn about longing hmm. you know that they, they long for a child yeah. and now this happens to them and they go into grief and mourning and that that longing they have to learn and get over it okay that's also very important such a beautiful learning you know yeah. just longing for yeah. something that's also so lovely yeah. to learn yeah. i mean i'm saying lovely to learn but i know somebody out there may say that's nothing lovely about it but if you look at it from yes. the soul's aspect no yes. this is also a beautiful learning that yes. you can have you know i'll tell you an example of somebody who had come to see me kafi saal ho gaye is baat ki is a good friend of mine now so he came to see me and he told me that he has some white patches around his mouth so but i i couldn't see those white patches actually so i said i can't see them he said no 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 they are there so he was convinced that they are there okay he said i want to do a past life session and i want to understand myself he didn't tell me much about himself actually okay except the fact that he felt lonely and he felt abandoned and stuff like that when he lay down he started laughing and you know i kept giving some instructions and he started laughing more and then i said now how do i stop this guy from laughing So after some 2 3 minutes I just told him what are you hiding behind your laughter he stopped laughing and after that the session went off well now at one point in the session he started shouting 
crying, yelling. He said that my stomach is getting bigger. It's bloating. He had already told me that he was a woman in that lifetime. And now he didn't tell me he's pregnant, but I realized that maybe he was experiencing childbirth. And then generally we don't touch our clients, right? Because yeah. we don't. But he was shouting so much. So I wanted to know exactly where the pain is. So I just touched his abdomen and he started shouting more. He said, oh my God, like my little baby is coming out. And I said, okay. And then, and then he started crying. So many emotions he had in that 15, 20 minutes. And the baby was still born. And then he tells me that, oh God, like I never want to become a woman again. I never want to have a baby again in my life. I said, okay. I said, look at the baby and recognize the baby. Who is this baby in your current lifetime? Then he tells me he's my partner. Oh. But he had not revealed this to me prior to the session. Okay. And then after the session, he cried a lot. And I said, well, your partner is now back with you, right? And he said, yes. And I'm so happy that he's, he's back with me, you know, and that's when he revealed that he actually had an alternate sexual orientation. Okay. So sometimes such beautiful things can come out mm. just by experiencing yourself as a woman mm. and having a stillborn child. Mm. And that's the reason in the current lifetime, he's not a female. So he understood the choice of his gender. Mm. He understood the sexual orientation that he has chosen in the current lifetime. He understood the helplessness that he feels because he's not staying with his partner. He wants to go because the partner belongs to another country, but he's not getting a visa to go there. So, you know, I mean, mm. so many things were revealed to mm. him. And uh, honestly, uh, his life changed after that. He got a visa and now he's happy with his partner. Okay, wonderful. So how things can change, yeah? So stillbirths also have a story. Hmm. Ma'am, I want to talk about karma. Karma is that sutra or thread that ties us from the previous life onto the next life. So the reason I choose my present family or my present birthplace or even my present country, the reason I'm born in India and not Pakistan, for example, is based on Past life karma. Can you yeah. explain this concept to yeah, me? Yeah, absolutely. The place that you choose, the family that you choose, yeah. the gender that you choose, like we said, yes. everything depends on your karma. Yes. What is it that was unresolved, unfulfilled? Where will it get fulfilled? Yes. So suppose I want to learn about family responsibility mm. and duty. Mm. India is the best place. Yeah. Right? If I want to learn about my own self and work on my own self and learn about becoming, let's say, kind of independent, then possibly a Western country is good enough for me. If I want to learn about, you know, living close to the beach and the shore and having a job, which is maybe a fisherman's job, then I'll be born in a coastal country. So it depends on the occupation. It depends on uh, the learnings that you have to do. It depends on so many aspects, actually. It's very variable, very different. Mm. Every time you choose a life, you're learning about family, you're learning about self, you're learning about money, mm. about how you're going to utilize your physical body. Suppose you want to learn more about the machine, the vehicle called the body. You may take a job of becoming, a, let's say, a kind of manual labor. Okay. Where it's more about the physical than the intellectual. Mm. Mm. So it's very, very variable, mm. the kind of choices that we make, you mm. know. Mm. So let's talk more about the kind of individual karma that we have, the family karma that we select, collective karma that we have and the contracts that we create. So let us say that this is you. Okay. Okay, right in the center. Yes. And you have certain people in your life that are very close to you. So you have certain people in your life who are very close to you. You have a daddy, mummy, husband, sister, brother, but you may not be close to everybody, right? So I want you to place two people whom you are very close to and you can place them in this circle. Okay. Okay, so whom, whom have you placed close to you? My parents, my mother and father. Okay. Now, others, 
your friends or relatives or whatever. Anybody else whom you are not that close to, okay, you can select two more people and you can place them on the other rings. This one? Uh, anywhere. Okay. A little, where, wherever you want to place them, yeah. Okay. Okay. And there are others mm. you may have met as strangers. Yes. Okay. Let's say me. Mm. Huh? You just You're met. not a stranger, though, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. we just met recently. So huh. maybe you can place me somewhere on the outer circle okay. at this moment. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Now this this person is you. So you have to work with your own individual karma, with your family. Mm -hmm. So you will have a contract. Yes. Right. Maybe you have a close contract with your parents, mm -hmm. but not that close contract with this person here. Yes. And it's okay if this person disappears after some time, let us say. Mm -hmm. Or maybe with this person. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this person is on the periphery. Yes. Now, let, let us say I'm on the periphery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here. But there can be a time when possibly I may get closer. Yes. So, your family karma and your collective karma hmm. can change places. Okay. Let us say that many years later, this person who is here hmm. helps you hmm. in some way. Hmm. Maybe this person is an old school friend. Hmm. But now, somehow, circumstances change and this person starts working for you hmm. in close contact. Hmm. So families keep changing. Don't okay. think that your biological family is the only family that you have. Uh -huh. You have a huge spiritual family. Okay. Right? So there's individual karma, there's family karma, and there's collective karma. Collective karma is country, birthplace. Yes. So let us say this is... You were born in India and yeah. you have this collective karma. Yeah. There can be many people here yeah. in your collective space. And this is another country. Yeah. And you can place people here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you there's another country here. Yeah. We can place people here. Right? Mm -hmm. And maybe many, many years later mm -hmm. you decide to migrate. Mm -hmm. And now you will move from here to here. Okay. And now you're going to learn things about this country and you will have friends here. So collective consciousness keeps expanding. Your collective consciousness, the way you are connecting yourself to people hmm. keeps expanding. So expansion is the key. Okay. Right? You include more and more people. You include more and more occupations. You include more and more emotions. Because when you move to another country, there'll be different emotions that you'll be experiencing. Hmm. Maybe something else you'll be experiencing, hmm. right? So, as you start expanding, hmm. your collectiveness increases. So, there is individual karma, your own karma that you've carried, your prarabdh. There is family karma, your contracts with your family members. And there is a collective karma, which, which is related to others that you will keep including in your life. And this keeps increasing. And this keeps increasing. One okay. life, another life, many lives. And so possibly if this is your 1017th life, imagine the collective consciousness that yeah. you have generated mm. and the amount of people you have met mm. over all those lifetimes, mm. right? If you have to place them here, it's impossible to place mm. them, right? As you expand and as uh, more and more lifetimes are explored, in the current lifetime, you will decide on what you are going to learn. And based on that life script that you have created, you will generate this drama of yours. This is how a blueprint is going to be created. This blueprint that you are living is already generated in your afterlife. Mm. And that blueprint is now materializing here. Got it? So when all these soul groups intersect, look at the matrix that's going to be formed. Mm. That becomes your universal consciousness. Okay. So all these collective consciousnesses that I have generated over my lifetimes at one level may seem personal. Mm. But at the other level, 
they are universal hmm. because they are all intersecting each other hmm. so if i have to draw lines let us say then from here to here and then they'll be here the line will come from here to here and they'll be okay intersecting lines hmm. that is why this whole universe is like a web hmm. it's all intersecting that is why we cannot be separate we are one mm-hmm. that's also mm-hmm. important to understand that even if you want to be separate you cannot mm-hmm. be separate because at the highest level we are all one okay all the collective consciousnesses come together to make this whole universe work mm-hmm. the yeah. more we restrict ourselves ye mera parivar mm. hai this is my family these are my parents mm. these are my siblings and we keep worrying yes. worrying about them yes yeah you will always be unhappy yes you don't have a father it's okay but there are many fathers in this world yes. who may adopt you as a wonderful child yeah. right when i go to the park in the morning and i see the senior citizen sitting there and the children playing and the children going and you know sitting with them and on their lap and fondling them and all that it's so wonderful right you may have one grandparent at home but you have so many in the park yeah. and each one of that grandparent is actually giving you love yes so the more you understand this whole matrix you can actually understand the the fact that you are not alone yes you know and when you believe that you are not alone how can you be unhappy hmm. so if everything is karma if the life that i'm experiencing in this life is karma then where does free will come we are born with free will okay free will is a gift that is been given to us whether we are able to use it or not depends on us okay so every time we wake up in the morning we have some free will yeah whether i want to brush my teeth at 10 or when i want to brush my teeth at 11 that much of free will we have right but do we have free will for big things in life let us say decisions that we have to make in life yes we do have but it depends on your soul's maturity somebody who is an immature soul will not have much free will because he will not know how to use it mm. so he will not be given that much free will mm. but somebody who has come in many times knows how to utilize the free will okay. and so he will come with free will okay how is free will shown to people like i mean how would i know i have more free will right when things happen to me without me doing anything i am exercising maximum free will but when things happen when i'm doing something like i'm putting a lot of effort but nothing is coming yes. my way yes. possibly i'm ruled more by my prarab than exercising my free will okay but when things materialize without me even doing anything then the free will mechanism has got activated okay. without me even knowing it kai log hote na kehte hai ki mere jeevan mein main sochta hu hota hai ha because free will mechanism has got active okay prarabdh kam hai hmm so free will zyada hai hmm but a person who struggles all his life is carrying more prarabdh and less free will okay so we are given free will to utilize but how are you utilizing it but you don't know how to utilize it so can i break that past karmic impression in this birth yes you can you can the example i can give is let us say kind of anguli mal hmm anguli mal was driven by prarabdh hmm. right and then lord buddha arrived on hmm. his path hmm. and he said when will you stop hmm. an anguli mal had a transformation hmm. as if all his 100% free will he utilized aha uh-huh. he did, he was unaware that he has free will that is why he was doing what he was hmm. doing but at that moment as if the lord made him aware hmm. he didn't gift him free will hmm. he made him aware that he has free will yes and so anguli mal exercised his free will hmm. the problem is we are unaware mm. so we think we don't have any free will mm. that's not true mm. my next question to you ma'am is related to pitra dosha something that you already do a lot of research on what is pitra dosha and do we suffer from some kind of an ancestral trap so let us say there is a family okay. which has four sons mm. but one son is suffering from pitra dosha the others don't have it 
How will I know I have got Pitru Dosha? Because I'll go to an astrologer. The astrologer will tell you that you have Pitru Dosha. Mm. Correct. On my own, I will not know I have Pitru Dosha. Yeah. But I will wonder why am I suffering when my other three brothers are doing really well. I'm not able to make money. Mm. And I'm not able to make money exactly like my dad was not able to make money. Hmm. So I will say Pitru. Mane, okay. My father's some curse or whatever has come to me. So I am suffering from Pitru Dosha. Now, the philosophy of Pitru Dosha spiritually is, I am suffering not my brothers because I am that ancestor who actually created havoc. So I am paying for the problems I created when I was my own ancestor. Mm. Getting the idea? Mm. So I am born, but I am my own ancestor mm. who is born now again. As that ancestor, I had created problems and I am suffering that now. So I am suffering from Pitru Dosha. That Pitru is me only. Achha. Pitru koi aur nahi hai. So I am the ancestor. Ah, I am the ancestor. Mm. Who did something wrong? Some curse came to me and now I am born again and I am suffering that dosha. That's mm. all. So when we do sessions, we realize, they realize, people realize that, oh my God, I am only that person who did what I did. Ah. Maybe a couple of generations ago. Mm. Because we are born in the same family mm. circuit. Mm. 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 That is how family karma is also created. Okay. So Pitru Dusha is a very vast subject, of course. But this is what people need to understand. Okay. And they can go for uh, sessions, okay. which we call family constellation sessions, okay. where we do transgenerational healing. Okay. So healing across generations have to be done. And for that, people need to make their family trees. So once they make their family tree, a constellator will understand what is happening in the family. Mm. There's repetitive patterns that are shown, mm. right? Early death of children mm. or early yeah. died, or lack of money, something will be there. Yeah. And in the family tree, you will see only certain people are having it. Mm. But from where did it start is important. Mm. So that ends that person who is the ancestor who started it and now everybody is suffering in the family. Mm. So when you do transgenerational healing, you work with these kind of Pitru Dosha uh, elements. Okay. So we don't do puja and all yeah, that. Exactly. There's <laughs> so, another way which is more yeah, scientific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people do puja and they go to various yeah. uh, pilgrimages and all yeah. that stuff. That the people can do that, no okay. problem. And, uh, but this is the more scientific and spiritual way of taking responsibility of what started with you. Okay. So again, I want to emphasize, unless you take personal responsibility mm. in life, nothing can change. Mm. Change can only happen with taking personal responsibility. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the second innings with me and hopefully many more to come. <laughs> And you're such a gifted speaker. You're so talented and, of course, so warm and compassionate. So thank you so much for having this. With thank, thank you. you thank so you, Shloka. It was an honor, <laughs> honestly. And I love you. Are, I love you too. <laughs> and please continue all the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In case you'd like to be a part of our online and in-person yoga, diet and spiritual programs, you can join our WhatsApp group below where we post all our upcoming programs and give free tips on health, diet and lifestyle.